Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us for another Trinity Towns event. I'm Emma Sillett, the College Librarian, to be introducing Maria, who is Trinity's Fellow in Spanish. She's the University's Associate Professor in Spanish American Literature and an academic champion for TORCH, the Oxford Centre for Research in the Humanities. Maria's research has spanned many topics from ghosts to modernism to scientific writing in Latin America. And this evening, she's very kindly off to talk about her recently published book, Geopolitics, Culture and the Scientific Imaginary in Latin America, which is co-edited with Joanna Page. So Maria, over to you. Hi everyone, and thank you for being here. I will say I'm in, I'm, I am somebody in the middle of exams marking. So if I go into periods of absolute silence, it's because my, my brain is, is doing something funny. Um, so yes, I'm here to talk about this book, which as I was saying earlier, is, is a book that is not by me really. It's, it's, it's a collaborative effort um, that started with me and Joanna Page, and, um, and I'm going to just talk about that process. Um, um, and it was published last year uh, in 2020 by the University of Florida Press, which is an excellent press for anybody who is um, working on Latin American studies. So we went for a publisher that um, being so close to, to Cuba, um, they, they, and they, they are great. Um, they are great supporters of Latin American studies. So we, um, we decided to go with that press. Um, so just a little, um, a little bit of background on geopolitics, culture, and the scientific imaginary in Latin America. Um, this began uh, some time ago, many years ago, actually, when I arrived in Oxford in 2012. Joanna Page, who is a reader in Latin American um, studies in Cambridge, um, we got together and we decided to start a project, um, a collaborative project, uh, and we applied for a grant from the AHRC, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, where uh, we, we wanted to establish an international network um, of scholars. And the network was, uh, was in the end called uh, Science and Culture in Latin America. And the idea for that, um, for that network is that we thought she was working on science and literature. She's actually working on science literature and film and graphic novels. And I was working on 19th century science and literature. And we, we, we spotted each other actually in a conference in Oxford um, before I even got my job at Oxford. And we said, aha, we, we have to collaborate. Um, so finally it came to fruition. We put together this project and the HRC granted us a nice sum of money so that we could establish an international network of people all across the world. Um, and when I say world, the people who actually um, signed up in the end were coming from Europe, from Latin America, uh, from the United States, from here. So pretty much, you know, a big chunk of the world, but it, we could have been more global. Um, and the idea was, um, if, if you know anything about um, about the status of uh, of well of, of universities in many countries across Latin America, Clive is here, so he he will know full well. Um, it's very difficult for a Latin American academic to travel to the UK, come to a conference and have the money um, to, to spend a few days in Oxford and then go and travel and, 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 you know, and, and be able to, to establish a conversation in person. And th th this was a day of in-person events, of course. This was, we had the network between 2013 and 2016. Um, so we very much wanted to have you know, establish a rapport with other people um, in Latin America. And we, instead of, so we, we were able with the money that we got was to bring them over here, but also we could go over there. So we had conferences in Puerto Rico. We had conference, we had a conference in Argentina and Buenos Aires as well, as well as in Oxford and Cambridge. So from there, we, we had loads of contributions from people all over South America, all over the Caribbean. Um, and, and like I said, Europe and the US. And then we decided at the end of our project, after a, um, at the end of our collaboration, when we had a number of outputs, that we wanted to have a collection. But instead of having a kind of uh, a collection of everything that was written, a kind of conference proceedings type volume, we decided we wanted a more targeted um, book. We wanted to kind of do, um, we, we wanted to focus on the idea of Latin America as a source of scientific innovation um, and also that blending of, um, 
of creativity and science that um, we know is alive and well in Latin America and has been alive and well for centuries, but that we don't really talk about. And so what you what you get is this volume, um, which, you know, it has, it doesn't have, you know, we, we probably saw hundreds of people in our conferences, but in the end, we have 15 chapters by 15 amazing scholars from uh, Latin America, working in the US, um, working here, working in Europe. Um, and we wanted then this to be, again, not just a quiet project of them sending us their chapter and then, um, um, and then us just editing it. It's just basically, we, we wanted the editorial process to be a conversation. So we all had input into each other's essays. We told each other where the essay could be stronger and also where the essays could uh, connect more and have more sinew amongst um, themselves. So what you have is, is a really kind of eclectic mix of essays, but the, the topic is, okay, Latin America, we don't think of science, Latin America as the mega, the, the mega center of scientific thought. Um, and why is that? And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very basic question. Um, and what we also, what we wanted to say is like, well, science has always been there. It's just that science is what we tend to think of science as this kind of immutable objective thing that is universal, but, actually it's a scientific construction. And science is something that is very much um, based around ideas of institutions and the people who make institutions and who make certain hierarchies of where the, good, the big science is from and where, the, the, and where their um, science basically uh, cannot be generated. There's also the thing that science comes with infrastructure, science comes with universities, science comes with institutions that, you know, with, with money that can generate laboratories and laboratory spaces. Latin America, well, those, those spaces um, exist in Latin America, but obviously they are not, um, they have not had the same kind of money poured into it as, a Euro as European institutions um, or, or American institutions of that. So um, we, we went with uh, with essays that talked about that kind of imbalance, that kind of unequal story of global science. Um, and we also were very interested in talking about, well, you know, let's talk about the moment of encounter of Europeans arriving in, in Latin America. What did they find? Um, did they find people with, um, with no knowledge of the world, no natural knowledge? Well, no, it was absolutely the opposite. You know, it was a clash of cultures. Uh, and at that moment, moment the, you know, the arrival into the Americas, the encounter between European and indigenous science was fascinating. And we have chapters, for example, by there's one chapter by uh, somebody, Yari Perez Marin, who teaches at Durham University here who addresses how those encounters generated history, a, a medicine, medical practices that were very much kind of um, synergy between European knowledge and indigenous knowledge. So we have, and we have a number of chapters on that. Another person who um, contributed to this volume, Heidi Scott, who's a geographer, she uh, talked about how mining in, um, in South America in the early modern period, and I'm talking 16th, 17th centuries, mining also is a science that um, in the space of South America depended very much on conversations, on literally just one person, one European, one uh, what we call a criollo, getting knowledge about a zone, an area from people who are indigenous um, and who know the, the area better than anybody. And um, so we have chapters like that. Um, and then um, we move into the 19th century, which is the century that I know a bit more about, um, where science uh, becomes an aspiration, a complete desire, because you see Latin Americans saying, oh, you know, here's London, here's the Royal Society, here's France, and they have their societies and Germany. Um, and we want to be an equal pegging with them. So what do we do? A lot of Latin America in the 19th century, especially after the wars of independence, they were they had ser serious financial problems. So you don't see a kind of expansion of laboratories. You don't see expansions of universities in some places. You don't see universities for a long time. Um, and so what do you do when you want to create a culture of science and, a, and, a, and institutions of science and you don't have the means to do it? 
And my, this is where my chapter comes in. Well, you talk about it. <laughs> you write about it a lot. You claim that you know a lot about science. You create genres of science. You create, you know, you see that Jules Verne is doing some science fiction so in, in France. You want to do that too. You do all these kind of literary practices that say, that basically speak science, even if the science is not being made um, in the same, at the same level, at the same, same kind of experimental functional level of, um, that, that we see in the US, that we see in Germany, that we see in the big, in, in, in big laboratory and big scientific countries in the 19th century. We also have a chapter from somebody who's a very important historian of science in Argentina, and that's Miguel de Azúa, who talks about how, how science is featured in national anthems, uh, how there's a whole history of this talking about science, of generating a narrative of science in all these different other genres, like, for example, a national anthem. Um, and, and so it, and it's a fascinating uh, story, even, even if, it, if it seems a bit sad. And th that is basically, it remains at a level of a desire more than you know, an infrastructural change. Um, you also have the, a, a great chapter, which I recommended to Sarah um, by uh, Gabriela Nusei, who's a professor at Princeton University, which is about what's, what you call the bone wars um, in Argentina. Because of course, as you know, uh, around in the area around Patagonia is where they have found some of the most unadulterated uh, fossils of massive um, dinosaurs. And so, of course, you can imagine the greedy uh, Europeans and Americans wanting to go down south and saying, well, we want that for the Smithsonian. Thank you very much. Um, and the Argentinians, um, especially this uh, paleontologist called Ameguino, he was like, no, no, this is ours now. And so you begin this kind of north-south battle um, over bones. Um, and not only over bones, but over findings that are like the weird, very strange um, uh, objects that turn out to be animal feces, prehistoric animal feces or skins. And um, so, and I have, she has some beautiful uh, drawings, uh, pictures here. Let me see. Not so beautiful when they're a bit more, um, let me see. So this is Fecal, fecal balls and leather, you know, this, these are findings in Argentina, um, around in, in Patagonia. And Patagonia remains a, um, a hub of, uh, it, it still is kind of like, it's still a place where uh, the culture of the bone wars is, 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 has, has prolonged, has been prolonged. And so you can see how in this area that is very kind of industrial, you still see um, the structures and, and, and this, uh, of, of dinosaurs. It's, it's, I don't know if um, any of you have watched movies like Pee Wee's Playhouse, but it reminds it, 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 uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure. It's like, you know, they still have like massive replicas of dinosaurs down there because that's where they used to roam. But all of that tells you that there's also a sense of nationalism that develops around the idea of, keep, of having your own dinosaur. And this, um, I think uh, some of the, um, one of the, the types of dinosaurs that they found there was the Giganotosaurus, you know, which is massive. And the, and you, you know, you have Argentinosaurus as well. So that's, um, that's all, so that's, that's the 19th century. As we move into the 20th century, and there I, I, I will, um, I will start uh, kind of um, winding down my, my explanation of the book. Um, you have a lot more experimentation with science. I mean, um, one chapter that I also really like, which is one of the first chapters in the in the book, is by somebody called Jens Andermann, who used to teach in the UK and now teaches in uh, NYU and New York University. And he talks about how in the 1930s in South America, at that point in the 30s, um, our, you know, South America had been the the home, well, had been exploited by northern um uh, let's say is you know, European, but also North American multinational uh, companies, which came with, um, I, but they came to extract natural uh, natural resources like rubber, for example, um, amongst many other. But rubber is, you know, you, you will know about the rubber trade um, perhaps a bit more, um, and rubber became very important, of course, with the history 
you know, from, from the automobile industry. And what happened is that at that point, you see how different landscapes in Latin America um, had already gone through different eras of extraction and then destruction. And never, you know, and, and you know, absolute kind of, um, they, they have been depleted. So you can see this as early as the 1930s, as the 1920s or 30s, when, when you know, the act of extraction had been so incredibly, you know, full and, and devastating. And so Jens Anderman, who works more on the level of theory, he describes um, what's, what happened in this area in Argentina called Santiago del Estero. Um, and where writers who, anthropological writers, and you know, anthropology was, was a burgeoning field at the time, how um, they, they start developing what we know now as the theory of, of, of the Anthropocene. Um, and which is the idea that, you know, this, the world has been, you know, dominated by man, is now at this point where natural resources have been completely molded by, by man-made forces. And so that's in the 1930s. You have a proto-anthropocentric th theory that comes from just the observation of the zone of South America where all this extraction um, and, and depletion has occurred. But there are good news uh, beyond that when we look into the 20th century. There's a chapter um, that I will point out by uh, Mara Polgovsky Escurra. Pol Mara Polgovsky uh, is a young scholar and she teaches art history at um, Birkbeck. And basically um, she, I'm just trying, trying to find the, the page. She has a chapter called Beyond Empiricism, Rolando Garcia's Theory of Complex Systems um, and the epistemological consequences of a nonlinear universe. So I'm going to unpack that a little bit. So we're talking about Rolando Garcia, who was an Argentine physicist. Um, and he wrote, um, Nature Pleads Not Guilty, Drought and Man. And this was in 1972. Now, Rolando Garcia is one of these great forces who uh, in, 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 in basically chaos theory and systems theory as well. It, and he hails from Argentina. And he basically comes up with the idea that science um, can be, is, is basically, again, constructed, but it needs the different situations, different kind of, um, so uh, let's say natural situations need to be observed from a variety, a kind of prismatic uh, variety of, of ways in order to get at the root of a problem. Um, so we also have, just to say, you know, we have chapters like Mara's who, that deal with, you know, the scientists, scientific, you know, important scientists within the space of Latin America who have made a great contribution to global science. Um, and I should say that within that, um, within that uh, same framework, you have to think about, um, I, I wanna go back to a chapter by another, uh, another person who wrote here, Carlos Fonseca Suarez, who is a novelist, but he's also, uh, he teaches at Trinity Cambridge. Um, and Carlos um, writes about that moment in Alexander von Humboldt's um, personal narrative. Because Humboldt, of course, uh, if you're familiar with him, he is the, well, uh, German, but Prussian um, explorer who was allowed in, you know, when the Spanish were kind of holding on to their empire and saying, no one, none shall enter. He was allowed. He, 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 the, 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 the the monarchs allowed him to come in and he did that beautiful kind of, uh, he left us kind of a personal narrative, but also beautiful drawings of different areas of South America. And also he went to Cuba, for example. So you have all these great illustrations and, and I'm sure you might be familiar with his beautiful drawing of the volcano of Mexico. Um, anyway, he finds this man in the middle of a jungle who had created a machine all by himself um, basically with no knowledge of, you know, he had, he, he didn't have a library full of engineering books or anything, but he, but what Humboldt encounters there is the fact that, you know, you don't need the, you know, this science happens in isolation because there is imagination, right? And imagination can accomplish anything, even if you don't have, um, at your disposal, all these different kind of mechanisms and institutions and facilities. So, um, 
So we we wanted to trace all these moments of just innovation, of, of perspicacity, also of that incredible encounter of different si systems of knowledge that can yield a di different types of knowledge about science, about medicine, about technology. Oh my gosh, and I and I must I must mention perhaps my favorite chapter of the whole uh, collection by an Argentine historian, very young historian called Hernán Comastri. And it's titled Inventions and Discoveries in Letters to Perón, Argentine President, Dialogue and Autonomy in the Popular Technical Imagination in Argentina in the 1940s and 50s. And what this is about is that when Perón comes to power in Argentina, they, they open an office where they say to the public, send us your ideas for technology, technological uh, inventions. And, and Hernán, he presented uh, this essay in Argentina when we, when we had um, our, our conference there. And I must, I must show you some of the drawings. People decided to start sending in letters uh, with um, sketches for um, flying saucers, <laughs> any kind of different machine. So it, you know, it, it was, there was a boom in, in, in highly innovative um, inventions, even if they were never going to get off the ground, literally. So um, that's another kind of moment that that opened. You, you think, ah, you know, what what an interesting idea that first the Peron government would do this, and uh, and second that people would be just let their their imaginations just take flight in, in such a way. And I will I will let me just get the um, one eighty seven. Let's see, right. It's going to give you a, a sense of so these he, he has been looking uh, Hernan has been researching the whole archive of these letters of which there are boxes upon boxes at the University of Buenos Aires uh, in Buenos Aires and yeah so you see the kinds of things that people are sending um, so this is just so I can drawings by the inventor of an extendable tower illustrating its multiple uses and this is in the Archivo General in the National Archive of Argentina There. So that's that's my that's my collaboration. It was it was so exciting. As you can see, it's very eclectic. We wanted to give um, we, we wanted to make this also a very international cast of authors. It's no good when you want to put together a, a, an inter, you know a, a collection based on an international collaboration, and then you all get you, the only thing you get is UK scholars writing. So this this is this is what we got and. Um, it's, I'm happy to send PDFs of this. I mean, it's not very good uh, for me to say this, but if you have access to the Bodleian, I think you can still get it for free for now uh, through the Hathi Trust. Um, but yeah, this is this is our baby. And um, oh, and, and the and the beautiful cover, by the way, is by a Cuban installation artist called Joan Capote, a very young um, Cuban artist. When I go to Havana, which is I think soon, I. I've been invited to his uh, to his um, studio, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. So, and it's it's basically a brain with galleries, uh, and people are walking inside of it. And he, and it actually was an installation where you could actually walk inside a brain like that, which is which is really beautiful. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, we've got a question already from Sarah. I know in Europe there are a lot of gentlemen scientists where upper class men and women spent their time tinkering and investigating because they could. Was that how it tended to work in Latin America as well? I mean, depends on 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 the period. I think that there have always been gentlemen scientists um, in Latin America. There's there's um, um, I mean, in the nineteenth century, science was not just the science, what we understand as science now, and, and you know, nowhere. Science and social sciences had not broken off away from each other. Um, so you have um, even the field of archeology, span anthropology were still considered a science. So you have a lot of people who are doing armchair stuff uh, about all kinds of facets of science. And, you know, there are so many, um, there, there are a lot of incredible stories of, Oh, yeah, of people doing minor inventions um, in, in, in Latin America. And there's a lot of inventing around mining, especially in, in mining countries. Um, 
I will also give a shout out, even though he doesn't even feature in my in, in this book. But there's a writer, and Clive will know him very well. And Clive, I don't know if you if you rate him or not, but Horacio Quiroga, um, who wrote, he was he he was he wrote some of the you know um, most interesting short stories about um, horror short stories, really, in the in the early 20th century. But he. Um, he went to Misiones in the, in the middle of the jungle. You know, he, he was a man, he was from Uruguay. He lived in, 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 in the Rio de la Plata region in, in Buenos Aires. But he, he spent a lot of time in Misiones in the jungle making machines. Um, and so there you have somebody who, you know, in his younger life, he was a dandy in Buenos Aires. But then he had this other, this other kind of technological imagination. So, so there's lots of that. There's, um, in Mexico, which is the area that I that I that I study more, especially for this book, um, you also have a lot of armchair scientists speculating about the origins of um, well, the indigenous culture. You know, especially a lot of white men talking about the indigenous cultures and where where what could be underneath those pyramids. Uh, and they, you know, at, at first they didn't know what to do with the insane wealth of prehistoric and pre-Columbian um, artifacts in Mexico. And what they did was they just classified, they just named everything. Um, so, and that's, that shows you the process of, of kind of, of the development of archeology. span First you name, then you start explaining, oh, how are they connected to us? You know, like, wh what does this mean? If, if that culture civilization lived there, are we, are we also part of that civilization? And, you know, there was a very interesting racial um, uh, conversations to be had there. But yeah, there's, there's, there's loads of stories um, and way too many for me to, to even um, start listing. But Horacio Quiroga is a very good one, I think. I, I, there's great pictures of him shirtless in the middle of Misiones, just making stuff, you know, in a garage <laughs> type thing. <laughs> Oh, I have a question actually while um, other people are, are typing. So was it a challenge to bring a book like this together? Because it's got such an uh, impressive scope of geographical scope, I suppose, chronological, and in terms of the different nations to create a cohesive book, but also recognising the, the regional and national differences. Yeah, and that's, thank you for that. I think it was very important for us. It, there's also a tendency um, to think when we say Latin American to kind of prioritize certain areas of Latin America, the big three, maybe what we call you know, Brazil, uh, Mexico and Argentina. Um, so we definitely wanted to make sure that it was not a book about the big three, but that it was a book where different countries and different cultures are, are being represented. So we definitely thought about that kind of spread. We thought about historical spread. So we basically targeted the best that we could find, the best people who, I mean, and most of these people participated in our conferences. There's only one chapter where we actually commissioned a chapter from somebody who had not been able to attend our conferences. Um, so we wanted a historical scope, but also geographic scope. And we wanted also a mix of disciplines. So we have historians, we have, um, well, we have historians, we have literary scholars, and we have people who work more with visual art, art historians. Um, one question, um, a lot of, uh, some of, a number of these people were also trained as scientists before they, um, they arrived in the wonderful world of the humanities. So, so we also have um, had this level of interdisciplinarity represented here. I mean, it's every collection is an incomplete book, and and we, I think, fifteen chapters. It was it was good. Um, we had to make some really hard choices um, because we we did have a lot of people participating. Um, like we 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 had a conference in Puerto Rico that was all about science fiction. And and we had you know we had to make a, a, some some very difficult choices about that about who we wanted to select, but um, the result is incomplete yet I hope exciting and and the chapters are small enough uh, so that you can just kind of go in there and just can you know pique the imagination and people can will want to read more I hope. Uh, if I can ask another question as well. Hmm. I know you said that the, the contributors were all very diverse and, and interdisciplinary. Is the understanding of science um, that's explored in the book very interdisciplinary? Obviously, science is interdisciplinary, but you mentioned about mining and about so that climate change and understanding of the 
anthropocentric views of um, of history and our current age. Was there also social sciences involved in that understanding, or was it more what we would term guess hard sciences? Well, I mean, definitely social sciences were involved in that because when you think about, as I was saying to Sarah, this kind of this in it's very difficult to separate social science sometimes from science especially when you think about 1850s to i don't know mm -hmm. i would say up until the beginning of the 20th century so yes i mean we we come from the fact like i said that science is a social construction um that science is not we cannot think about it as universal i mean there's there, there have been choices made about how we think about science and and there we have made you know historically you see how the development of the scientist as the person um, that holds a certain knowledge about a field, um, that is also a construct, that is something that has been developing and has a, hist has a history, has, has a, a number of different iterations. So definitely social science is involved in, in, in that conversation because we have to understand the development of, of these institutions and how, and how science is, is arranged not only well, how how it's compartmentalized, how how it has branched, um, and and that that also develops out of a kind of international story, of of you know of communication among scientists and of, of, in clusters, and as you saw with the dinosaur um, chapter about competition and about possessiveness and nationalism, and and so yeah, it's, it all it's all embedded with an idea of the social. That's great, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Bearing to ask, Clive. Clive has one. <laughs> oh, Clive, go ahead. Yes, but I'm not being a scientist. I'm finding it difficult to get a sound coming. From my <laughs> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, very interesting. Um, <clears throat> one thing I don't know how modern you come in your book, but I was yeah. just thinking about <clears throat> uh, the point that you make about nationalism in science is a very very interesting. And just reading, you know, in the press about the um, Cuban development of their own COVID vaccine mm -hmm. and the fact that they call it the sovereign one. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's a really nationalistic name that they give. I mean, obviously, they've got reasons why they can't afford to buy in vaccines from other places. Yeah. But I, I wondered their um, scientists in Cuba talking about that vaccine and saying we could have gone and worked in the States and we could have earned a lot of money, mm -hmm. but we've stayed here. Yeah. You know, we've, because we're proud of our institutions. We're proud of our nation. Um, mm -hmm. is, that, is that common in Latin America or is that something unique to Cuba? So, yeah, thank you. And I think that they have three vaccines in the making in Cuba, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. So um, and it's three. fascinating. I, I'm fascinated by the way that, you know, well, Cuban medicine has just, I mean, it's always been important, but it's always, you know, especially since 1961, it's it's been it's been it's become even more of a national um, sense of pride, because it's almost like science against the odds, right? Uh, you know, it's like you, you can block us, um, but you can do whatever you want, embargo us, but we're, we're going to. We have they have this incredible kind of humanitarian um, tradition in medicine, so, okay. In the introduction to this book, we talk a bit about what happened to Argentine science in the 20th century, because you have the repression of academics in Argentina with, um, I forget the actual date, La uh, Noche de los Bastones, when, when basically um, the state came into universities with you know with with sticks to you know and, and to basically enforce repression um on on you know just to silence academics especially because academic academia is is, uh, is always linked to a certain political faction etc with that with events like that you have a complete exile of of uh, of science you know there's that you, you see a brain drain in in so many countries in argentina like argentina sorry but countries across latin america and so that's the other interesting kind of sociological bit about latin american science is that there's a lot of you have to talk about exile when you talk about you know scientific minds and you know you have you have so many inventors um i think that the inventor of the color tv 
for example. Um, I forget his nationality, but you know, one, one person who, who was instrumental in the creation of that fled. You have um, physicists who are, who, who fly, I think other examples of Nobel Prize winners who go to universities in the US, they settle in MIT, they settle in, in University of Southern California, but it's because of political repression at home. Um, so what happened, the, the question is what happens to this idea of nationalism um, in, you know, and, and, and the kind of pride of, of local science when you have, you know, when forces are, you know, political politics and science clash in, in, in such a way. Um, so, you know, to, with examples like Cuba, where, you know, and Cuba also saw a massive brain drain, of course, before uh, 60, because of, since 1959, but they also were able to, they're, they're unique in that they were able to retain this kind of um, massive, yeah, energy around, around science and, and an ability to, but I think you also have to look at it country by country. So I think wherever you see much more, uh, a lot of dictatorial regimes like in Chile, Chile, Argentina, et cetera, you see this kind of massive exodus, which obviously um, harms science nationally. I don't know if that answers the question, Clive. Mm, yeah, it's very interesting. That. Um, yeah. Just, just as you mentioned him, don't know if, I, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, oh, yeah. Sorry. Just <laughs> as you mentioned Quiroga, I, never, I had no idea that he made machines in the jungle. Very interesting. Yeah, if I find the picture, I'll send it to you. Or maybe one, yeah. Yeah. one thing I thought was interesting, as far as I remember him, is his interest in um, sort of the physiological or psychological effects of physiological states, as yeah. if he's a sort of almost like an amateur doctor or amateur mm -hmm. psychologist looking at what morphine does to the body and mm -hmm. so on. I mean, only touching on it. I don't. Did he have a scientific background? I think he was again self-made. He was he was um, he was a self-made scientist, and he had a great kind of mechanical. But you're absolutely right. And for those of you who who don't know Horacio Quiroga, it's um, you know he has one story of um, I think the most famous one of a woman who marries this man, and it's kind of this, you know very cold relationship, and they and then she takes to her bed, and she doesn't get up for I guess weeks and, and you know and, and she starts having hallucinations that her husband is this kind of big ape at the edge of the bed and in the end she dies and then when they lift her pillow the pillow is really heavy and they open it up and in, in the middle of all the feathers there's this big parasite that had been sucking her blood uh, from her head from her brain and then he ends like well yeah you can find these uh, in aviaries and blah 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 and that's the, the last line of the, of the story so yeah, he has this idea, he has that, but also he's somebody who is fascinated by cinema. He has these, he has this kind of proto Woody Allen uh, um, story called the specter of, a, you know, just like in that, in the Purple Rose of Cairo where, uh, by Woody Allen, where the a man, you know, from a film is able to walk out into a theater and then, you know, there's this kind of, so he, he's just, he, he, he tried it all, I think. Um, and, you know, Equally, people like Ruben Darío were experimenting with with ideas of metempsychosis and things like that. So it's it's just it's just the, that period of, of the end of the nineteenth century, beginning of the twentieth. It was so eclectic, and spiritualism was everywhere in there. There's we also have a great chapter on spiritualism. Um, spiritualism was a science. Um, it was considered religion plus science equals one wonderment. <laughs> Thank you, Clive. Thanks. C has a question which follows on from Sarah's. In the 19th century, how much interaction was there between writers from Latin America and the experimental scientists of the US and Europe? How much collaboration? Uh, interaction, yeah, collaboration and... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just, it's, it's a really, it's a big territory. And I think, um, one very key area we have, for example, in Cuba, and I'm, you know what, like, again, this is the exam marking and, and having a six year old, but I'm, I'm forgetting the name, but you have some great collaborations around tropical medicine in the 19th century and the early 20th century. You have 
Um, and that's where you see the conversations happening on a trans on an international level. Um, one of the biggest uh, doctors around the issue of um, malaria was Cuban, but also again, one person who migrated um, eventually. So you have those points of contact. Another very interesting set of, you know, a, a story that I know quite well is the story of when Americans and Europeans try to get into Mexico because of the pyramids, because of the pre-Columbian um, findings. Mexico is, is, as you know, full of, of it has incredible wealth, um, cultural wealth. And a lot of people try to get in there. Um, a lot of French people, let's not talk about British Museum, etc. cetera. Um, Smithsonian uh, Institution, which was developing, uh, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. I find those relationships to be unequal relationships because what you have is a kind of hunting. Um, but in Mexico, again, nationalism, nationhood, you have you had uh, the president, very problematic president, uh, dictator for thir three decades, Porfirio Diaz. He's the first person who to say, we are going to put up, have guards guard our national treasures. So the, um, the uh, Teotihuacan, which is the, the ruins where you, you know, the, the Pyramid of the Sun, uh, Matt, you, you will be familiar with that. Those, um, those were the first guarded um, archeological areas, I think anywhere, um, because you saw that interaction be one of inequality. And there's also what, what comes out of that is the desire to um, expand, um, well, the protection of what is a national patrimony. So those are two interesting areas. I would say medicine, um, especially for these medicine uh, for, for these medical conditions that begin in the tropics, because you imagine with, with more travel, uh, especially for industry and stuff and stuff like that, you 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 get a lot more malarial um, infection and whatever. So you have a, a lot more of uh, communication about how about cures, and and so there you can see how you could you could have you have histories in which indigenous medicine. It, you know, combines with Western medicine and 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 those interactions. Yeah, they, they develop across time, really. That's great. So, if there are no more questions, then all it remains for me to say is thank you so much for for such an insightful, entertaining talk. I think, uh, so I think there's one from Nigel. Nigel oh. asked a question in the chat, I think. Did you? Oh, you only asked it to me, sorry. Oh, sorry. Well, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> um, uh, so, I don't know if, Nigel, do you want to speak yourself? No, you're okay, right, I'll do it. Um, so, Nigel went to a talk at the Royal Geographic Society um, by Wade Davis, Professor of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia, on uh -huh. his book, um, Magdalena, River of Dreams. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, when I told when uh, Nigel told his grandson about it, he was told he was out of date because geography is no longer studied by countries, but is thematic. Which route did you follow? Is what Nigel's sort of asking. So this was a presentation on the Magdalena River in, in Colombia. The, the book by the anthropologist uh, Wade Davis about okay. Colum Colombia. So yeah, okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, did I go thematic? What, what did we do? Um, we, we did, we have, let, let me just kind of give you a sense of the structure of the book. Um, we, we had a section on, um, scientific landscape. We had a section on Latin America as a site of knowledge production. So basically where knowledge can originate from the experience of being in the space of, of, in a space within Latin America. And then we had a section on science and the modern nation. And this, this has pertains a lot more to the 19th century, what I told you about, let's just create a narrative of science because we need to, we need to talk science because the world is talking science. So you can see that these are thematic arrangements and then within each section, we have different nations addressed. Um, so, so we had to kind of do both. Uh, so big kind of sections on a thematic um, idea, a theme or kind of, 
a conundrum. And then within that, we do we we did more nation. And just so you know, then section four is um, utopias and the convergence of, between science and arts. That's a lot more about how art uh, is inspired by by science. And um, and we have some great. Um, I will I will show you that. I know I, you were about to leave, and, and I'm cruelly keeping you here. Um, but we have this. Uh, we we have a chapter on um, the artist Eilson who basically um, took inspiration from the, uh, the Incan Kipu, which is, you know, a kind of mathematical model um, arranged around, you know, not, uh, I, I still don't understand it, uh, but <laughs> this was by this uh, scholar called Julio Prieto. But um, so this is uh, Jorge Eduardo Ayelson. Um, and then, so the idea of science and, and, and art uh, combining that section four, and then we see in the later section, the final section, how science can help us establish a critique of modernity um, and, and critique of, of, of yeah, of, of exploitation, of natural exploitation, things like that. Um, so yeah, we, we had to do all these kinds of different navigations. Sue also has another quick question before we finish. What are you working on next? So um, I am finishing a book, which uh, I'm very happy to say will be published by um, Oxford University Press. Hopefully I will send everything out um, to the publisher next year. And it's called Modernist Laboratory Science and um, uh, and the, sorry, and the poetics of progress in fin de siècle Spanish America, because that's my period. So the, the chapter that is here, uh, where I talk about a little known Mexican magazine, and Clive, you saw a presentation of that ages ago at the Latin American Center, that the first, one of the first kind of uh, a children's, a magazine for children to, to start learning science. So that, um, and it's by a man called Jose Joaquin Arriaga, interesting man. Um, he, so that chapter is going to be a longer chapter in my book, but I'm working on the idea of Spanish American modernismo and, and science within that and, and the idea of progress within modernismo. Um, so that's that. And then I'm also going to, I'm also starting to think about a new project, uh, for which I'm going to travel to Cuba, hopefully, and Puerto Rico, which is about, uh, childhood illness and, um, and, um, and US interventionism in the Spanish Caribbean. So I'm gonna be looking at um, actually very, very sad, you know, the idea of being living through a pandemic makes you think about pandemics a lot. So my first port of call will be, uh, I'm going to start exploring um, histories of, uh, of polio vaccination um, and inoculation in the, um, in, in the 1930s and 40s and 50s in, in, in Cuba and Puerto Rico. Um, because it's, there's there's quite a lot of, of narratives of personal narrative around polio, um, but I'm I'm going to be um, so I'm I'm just going to start looking into archives um, and seeing what else I can find. I have no idea what I'm going to find. I have no idea when I'm going to get there, uh, <laughs> but I have a grant to do it in, at some point in the next two or three years. <laughs> That's the excitement of the archives, I guess. You you have a rough idea, but who knows what you might find. No, and also, but now it's like, when, when can I get there? It was just, I, take, I, I took them for granted much too long. I think a lot of people who are working on archives are in the situation where we don't know when we're, I mean, especially archives that are not housed in the British Library or, or the Bodleian. I, I, I have to travel to see a lot of things um, that are, that have never been digitized and probably will never will be. And um, so I'm wondering where I'm gonna be able to go next, but Cuba's doing really great. I mean, then they're gonna have three vaccines by the time I get there. So it'll be good. <laughs> oh, that sounds fantastic. Well, thank you so much again, Maria, for, for your talk this evening, for answering our questions and thank you everyone else for attending.